We're going to continue the story that we uh, began last week, the story that I was determined not to have to tell, but we've made it through uh, the yucky parts. Now we get to uh, a more difficult part. We're in 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. Um, I'll be reading, oh, I'll be reading through verse 25. I was so tempted to read the whole chapter because then you'd know what happened with all the warfare and stuff that we were looking at last week and a few weeks ago, but... um, then I thought I should just limit to the first 25 verses. You can find that on page 310 in your regular print Bible, what some of us call the small print, or if you would like to make it easier on your eyes, it's in page 440 on the large print Bibles, beginning in the first verse of the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man. But the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me. And took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret. But I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day... The child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed put on lotions and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food, and he ate. His attendants asked him, Why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, Who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead... Why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah, which means loved by the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is not an easy story. This is not an easy aftermath. It does tell us something about how horrible uh, the previous chapter was, the story that it recounted and what David had done and all of his conspiring and plotting and planning, his indulgence and his greed. 
is utter loss of a sense of morality, a sense of integrity or character, uh, what he ought to do. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Um, We had to skip over where David uh, first is talking with Nathan. Nathan's a prophet, makes a very good successor to the prophet Samuel. Uh, Nathan is humble. Nathan is a trustworthy messenger. He speaks the word of the Lord. When he pops up earlier in this book, in the seventh chapter, it is because David has finally built his palace and he lives in ease. And he says to Nathan the prophet, his counselor, and the way they speak as if he were a friend as well. And he says, why should I live in all this splendor? And the ark of the Lord lives in a tent. I should build a palace. And Nathan, thinking this sounds like a pretty good idea, and is, I guess, uh, pleased that David would want to do something for the ark of the Lord, do something in terms of service and ministry, says, yes, you should go ahead and do that. But that very night, Nathan has a dream. And the Lord says to him, no, not by David will my house be built, but by another. And so Nathan goes right back to David, does not say, well, David, you shouldn't have done that. You really messed up there. Uh, Didn't let things fall apart when David tried to do it. He goes to David and he says, no, in fact, I was wrong. You are not the one to build the house of the Lord, but there will be another. Your son will do that. So he's humble. He's willing to be corrected. And he speaks the word of the Lord. How does David respond here? What has David been like? What has he been doing since this situation with Bathsheba and then Uriah and then all this plotting and planning and conspiracy and murder by proxy using this other army? Is David afraid he'll be found out? It doesn't look much like it. David's the king. And he thinks that very few people know and and just about that number maybe suspect what may have gone on here. He hopes that really nobody knows. He thinks he's the king. Nobody's going to question him. Is David a terrible hypocrite? Well, yes, in some ways, certainly. But when Nathan comes to him, this is a very interesting thing. People say, well, David, of course, thought that Nathan was telling him a true story. And it does say David burned with anger against the man. But think about this. There were two men in a certain town. There was a rich man and a poor man. Any of us knows 3,000 years later, this is a proverb. This is a parable. This is a story. We tell different stories now that begin in a similar way. Well, there was this man, and he went to this place. But David responds very strongly, viscerally, just primally uh, to the story and to the injustice that it represents. He knows in his heart of hearts this is wrong. This is a terrible wrong. And whether he thinks it's an actual person or whether he's just saying, I understand the point of this story and of course this man should die and he should pay back four times for the lamb. That's David quoting scripture, by the way. This is David. And I don't know his motivation. I don't know really how he responds here, except that he's angry. And he responds, he he has this outburst of of anger and, uh, and, and indignation over what has gone on here. But David's quoting scripture. He's saying all the right things. He's upset in the right places in the story. He's doing everything just right in front of the man of God, the prophet. Nathan knows the point of the story before he begins, and Nathan knows exactly what David has done. So the fact that David's quoting scripture, Exodus 22, that if you take something from somebody, um, in in this case uh, from a poor man, take uh, what little he has, you must repay it four times over. David thinks that the penalty for this ought to be death. That's all good. Does it mean that David has a bit of his moral compass still working? Uh, possibly. He's still got some sense of morality, some sense of justice intact, despite all of his really awful, abhorrent behavior that we've just seen in the chapter before. The last thing we read last week was, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. But David, whether he's trying to get away with something or whether he's just honestly, sincerely responding to the injustice, and it's a terrible story. This man had almost nothing. He had his children only to take care of, and he had this one little ewe lamb. He was never going to slaughter this little lamb. It was as if it were his own child. It slept with them. It lived in the house with them. It was part of the family. And the rich man who had everything snatches it out of his hand because he can, because he's got power and the poor man does not. We still know the injustice and the sense of wrong there that David experienced. And he just bursts out with this man ought to die as surely as the Lord lives. And that's an oath. If this man really exists, he ought to die. And I'm willing to be part of the people who make sure that this happens and that he repays four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. That caught my attention this week. He had no pity. Well, he was greedy. 
He was self-indulgent. Uh, he lorded it over others. He was arrogant. He abused his position and his power. But he had no pity, no compassion, no empathy or sympathy for the poor man and for his family. And that seems to outrage David as much as anything else. Then I had to decide how to read Nathan's response. Is Nathan angry? Is Nathan exclaim? I've got an exclamation mark. That's not in the Hebrew, though, so you have to figure it out. You are the man. Is Nathan upset? Is he angry? Is he sad? Is he embarrassed? can't believe that David would say this is such a terrible thing and such a wrong thing, and anybody would know that this is a terrible thing, and that David would end up condemning himself. The man who did this should die. Well, David, I'm talking about you. And David walks right into it. You are the man. There's this rebuke, this strong rebuke by Nathan. Why does he rebuke David? So does he say, you are the man? Is he angry when he does it? Is he sad? David, you're the one who did this very thing. Is he humble? Probably. Nathan's a humble man. Does he need to knock David over the head? Not just with the story, but with the point of the story that you are the one who has done this very thing. Does he want to have to go to the king and tell him this terrible thing? Do not wish to be a prophet. A prophet has a very, very difficult life. In this case, I think that Nathan's rebuke is the point of all godly rebukes. The whole reason that we would even think about trying to steer someone away from a course of action. That's, that's really what I was thinking of. It's a course correction. And it's not just a little nudge David needs. Ah, David, this isn't quite right. You need to go a little bit more in this direction. This is 180 degrees. You've got to turn all the way around. You are completely on the wrong road. Why would somebody rebuke another? What we see now uh, in the situation of somebody who's done something they think is in secret and then it comes out is the whole gotcha thing, right? We have finally caught you now. We're more than a year away from the election and we are all in the middle of the gotcha journalism and the gotcha politics and the gotcha debates, if you can call it that. We're, it's going to be a difficult year. I'm not going to have a lot of fun this year. But the point nowadays of catching somebody and then revealing, it seems to be so that we can show how bad this person is. And in the case of a politician, how they really ought not to be in office or ought not to be elected to office. And amazingly, that doesn't seem to do very much good anymore. We rebuke somebody sometimes because we recognize a similar tendency in ourselves and we want to make sure that the light falls on them squarely so that the light is not shining on us. And we can do that subconsciously, by the way. That's just a natural response. If I can point at you, then you're not looking at me. That's not why Nathan does any of this. The goal of Nathan's rebuke is twofold. One, to speak the word of the Lord. Speak the truth to power, which is the other thing that prophets do. Speak the word of the Lord to King David. But there is a goal. The goal is reconciliation, forgiveness, correction. We think of correction in terms of prisons. We think of correction in terms of discipline. And it's usually in a pretty negative light. But a godly rebuke is for the sake of the other person, not just because God's glory has been offended, not just because there is injustice in this world, but because this person made in God's own image can be redeemed Nathan needs to turn him around, and he has to do it quickly. And so he tells him this story, and David walks right into it. This man should die. This is heavy irony, if you know your Old Testament pretty well. What has David done? He didn't just displease the Lord. He has committed adultery. He took this man's wife while the man was still alive, committed adultery. What is the sentence for adultery in the Old Testament law? Death by stoning. This man deserves to die. The man who did this must die. You're right, David. That's what the law says. You've condemned yourself. I don't know who would dare to be part of the crowd that would stone the king, the Lord's anointed one. But David knows he is under the sentence of death. And I love the way that he responds. It's not what we usually see. There is a pattern now, and I don't know if we're ever going to get out of this pattern. Uh, but the first thing that you do is you deny it. There is absolutely no truth to that statement. That is just a rumor. It's, it's, it's unfounded. There's nothing to it whatsoever. 
And none of us believes anyone publicly speaking when they say that anymore. There's nothing to it, unless we know them. There's nothing to it. Ah, there's probably something to it. Then uh, you go after the person who made the accusation or wherever the rumor came from. You attack them, so you throw the spotlight on them, not on yourself. And then when it looks like you really can't get out of it, you start spinning things. Your motivation, their motivation, what really went on there. And then finally, if you cannot get away at all, then you issue the apology that is not an apology. I'm very sorry if anyone was hurt in the course of this situation. Sorry that I was so misunderstood. I'm sorry that you don't see what a great person I am. Whatever it is, it's couched in various ways because there are professional people who tell them how to issue an apology. That's not an apology at all. I'm not sorry really about anything. I'm sorry that you took offense at that. David had somebody killed so that he could take his wife when he already had more than one wife of his own. I'm sorry if that would cause offense to anyone out there, if somehow that hurt your feelings that I did this thing, which was horrible. David doesn't do that. He doesn't seek to limit the damages. He doesn't spin it. He doesn't even deny it. He thought he got away with it. But the Lord sees, and he confesses straight out, I have sinned against the Lord. Not secret, known by the Lord. And then this amazing thing happens. Nathan did not expose him out of anger or outrage, not for the sake of people knowing that their king really wasn't such a great guy after all, not to score points, not to have something in his back pocket. Next time, David's not nice to me. Um, David, you remember? There was this guy, what was his name? Oh, I think his name was Uriah. Not to tear him down. But so that David would end up saying exactly that. I have sinned against the Lord. And grace and mercy are shown to David. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, the, uh, the World War II era theologian in Germany, uh, amazing thinker, amazing writer, uh, such, such a smart man that people who study Bonhoeffer all the time, and he didn't get a chance to write a lot. He was uh, executed in a uh, prison camp uh, in, in uh, Nazi Germany in April 1945, and he was in his 30s. But there are still people who don't exactly understand all that he's saying. They're not really sure. He's just too smart for us. But he says a couple of things that are very easy to understand. He talks about the concept of cheap grace, presuming upon the grace of God. I know I should not do this, but I know that Christ died for me and for my sins. And so it's really going to be okay. I know I should not do this, but I know God's going to take care of it. God's going to forgive me. So it's going to be all right. David did not confess thinking, and now God's going to say everything's fine. David confesses straight out, but this is the costly, costly side of grace. God did not show David grace because David was such a good guy. We know now that he wasn't in some fundamental ways. In other ways, of course, fantastic. Enthusiastic, sincere, even when he's completely wrong, he's very enthusiastic and sincere. He is a man after God's own heart and also a man who wants to indulge himself in every possible way. But the costly side of grace here is that David does not deserve a thing that happens next. People die. And what does Nathan say to David? You are not going to die. David knows that that's what he deserves. The sentence for adultery is death by stoning. I deserve to die. God has found out this thing that I have done. And it's not just one thing. This whole mess of things that keeps snowballing and getting worse and worse. And the way in which I tried to get away with it. And God knows I am surely going to die. The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But Uriah has already died. And this child is going to die. And terrible things are the consequence of not just this one sin, but this great big mess, tangled knot of sins that David made worse and worse and worse. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. It's an undeserved favor, undeserved merit, undeserved gift. David deserved death. David deserved condemnation. David deserved not just a rebuke from the Lord, but being shunned entirely by God, by Nathan, by godly people. Uriah dies. The child dies. David lives. David lives knowing what he has done. But David lives. And in the midst of punishment comes pardon. And in the midst of discipline comes comfort. And reconciliation. 
You see, we're about a thousand years before Jesus is going to show up. About a thousand years before God himself will pay the price. There are still consequences of sin in this world. Our own sin, other people's sin, of course. But in this case, David receives what he does not deserve long before God himself gives us what we do not deserve, forgiveness of sins. I was really touched last week as we looked at the story of David, David doing these horrible things. More than one of you told me later that this is a pretty remarkable thing that David would end up being forgiven because I completely gave away the whole punchline of today's sermon. He's going to be forgiven. It's going to happen. But we were able to see in clear contrast, clear light last week that David, man after God's own heart, was a sinner in need of forgiveness. One of the best things I heard this week was, if God can forgive David, then God can forgive me too. That was the point. I hope every one of you got it. That's the point here as well. In the midst of tragedy, in the midst of loss, in the midst of horrible consequences of sin, God is offering David forgiveness. The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Eventually made right reconciliation, made and put it back in right relationship with God. And this is the story of good news. This is the gospel, not the gospel to David, only the gospel to you and me as well. We also, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? As Paul tells us in Romans, absolutely true. Yeah, what David did is particularly horrible, just horrific, just abhorrent. The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. That word comes to us as well. And I know, I know how we go about this world. We're really pretty good people, right? We're pretty good people. We're better than a lot of people. And if you read the newspapers, you know we're better than that person and that person. And that's really not the word that the Lord wants us to hear. The word the Lord wants us to hear is, it doesn't matter how good we are. We're not going to be good enough. But the good, great good news is this. For all of us the little minor sins that we think God really would just sort of brush over anyway, the major sins that we're worried might possibly keep us from God. Because of God's grace, this is the word, the Lord has taken away your sin. The wages of sin is death. That's the consequence. That's what we deserve. But the free gift of God, and that means grace, is forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ our Lord. The child dies and it's horrible and we can talk and even argue about how David responds. But I think I heard a response to one important line. Incredible thing I read this week. In the African church, this line from 2 Samuel is often used by pastors and elders and others in the church when somebody has lost a loved one. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Loss, he will not return to me. Hope, I will go to him. In the midst of loss, hope, and comfort. They may not return, but we will go to them. And then this incredible thing. David comforts Bathsheba, and then the Lord comforts David and Bathsheba. She gives birth to a son, and we're about to make a big transition from Saul to David and finally to Solomon. Here's we wind up our summer. They name him Solomon. That's a good name. The Lord loved this baby. And because he loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet. Nathan shows up again. How do you think David uh, uh, responded to that? Here comes Nathan. What has he got to say now? Has it not been hard enough? And Nathan comes with a word of comfort and a word of hope. Yes, Solomon, and that is what he's known by. But probably in the family, known by Jedidiah, which means loved by the Lord. Comfort and hope and grace and mercy and peace from the same God who came down to this earth in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The word made flesh dwelling among us, the sacrifice for sin, so that we can hear, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Why? Because the Lord loves you. Each one of us loved by the Lord, loved eternally, loved to the point of death and life again. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, help us hear hope and comfort in the midst of the aftermath of a terrible, terrible thing, a terrible series of things. Gracious God, when we come into your presence, when we feel that we are weighed down 
by ourselves, by our sins, by our faults and our flaws. Help us to hear the gospel, good news in Jesus Christ. The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die, but you will live forever in the presence of God. In the midst of loss, in the midst of mourning, help us to hear also David's words. Though they may not return to us, we will go to them. Give us great hope that we will one day be reunited.